What a beautiful day for the Lord to come again. That's what I woke up with this morning. I'm like, wouldn't it be awesome if Jesus came on Christmas? And I thought, you know, how many of God's people would be looking for Him on Christmas Day? How many of God's people would be in expectation of, of His return right here at the time that He was born? Him, you know, well, we don't know what time He was born, but the time that we celebrate that he was born because everybody's just rushing around just trying to get all the stuff done you know me too you know i was just running but my heart was staying right there pressing in for his presence hallelujah, hallelujah. thank you jesus hallelujah praise you jesus thank you father we glorify your name lord we praise you jesus we praise you, Jesus. Father, we're in great expectation. We're in great expectation for the return of your son. Father, we're in great expectation for you to come and for Jesus to come and gather us together to meet him in the air. And there we will ever be with the Lord for all eternity, Lord. Oh, Father, we thank you. And we praise you, Father God. We thank you, Father, for this hope that we have. Father, we thank you for this comfort that we have wherefore we can comfort one another with these words, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. Father, we're in expectation for Jesus to come and split that eastern sky. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. And I, I think, I think, you know, it's, we're just so close. We're so close to seeing the return of the sun. And today or tomorrow would be great. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. And then he comes and he rules this earth after the tribulation with a rod of iron. And he puts down everything that is not holy and pure and righteous on the earth. There won't be anything in the earth that he will allow under his rule <laughs> that is not pure and holy. He puts it all down rules this earth he rules this earth with a rod of iron and glorious righteousness hallelujah oh just so wonderful to think of no wicked evil things having any place in the earth satan's bound he's cast down into hell and he's bound and all of the imps have to go stay right there with him and none of them are out just polluting continually and bombarding the minds of people. Oh, glorious, glorious, glorious. Of course, we will all be ruling with Christ Amen. with the rod of iron. We'll be ruling and reigning with him. Thank you, Jesus, and keeping, keeping the peace. Uh, I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to that. How glorious. How glorious. But you know how glorious it is to rule and reign with him right now. How glorious it is to show forth the praises and the glory of God through our lives right now. To be the epistles written and read of all men. To be walking in the light as he is in the light. And letting his glory shine out of us. Hallelujah. First in us and through us, out of that fellowship and out of that relationship. And then out of us, that the light of the gospel can be seen through our lives, through how we live, through our conduct. You know, you think about it, every, every where you go and the things that you do and, you know, you get out into the business world and and things like that and, and, and there's things that can come up that can be quite trying to you at times and I remember I remember one time that um, it, it was many years ago probably 25 years ago or it was longer than that man time flies I don't know where it went but I was pretty young and I and I was out somewhere and I was all concerned about um, the situation I was in and so I corrected somebody that was doing what I needed them to get done and then the Lord corrected me 
He says, now when you're done with that, can you tell them, can you tell them about Jesus? Can you tell them about, can you give them the gospel of Jesus Christ? Were you a light of the word to that person to where now you can present and be a representation and them look at you and believe you <laughs> with your conduct? And uh, I thank the Father for his correction. I thank the Lord for that correction because that lets us know that we're, we belong to him, we're a son. We're adopted in, and we're, we're brought in, we're redeemed in, we're, we're grafted in to the vine through the blood of Jesus Christ. We've been brought in, heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. I mean, it's more than adoption, it's more than grafted, it's we're brought in heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And who the Father loves, he corrects. So with correction, it, you know, it should be counting it all joy. All joy. And I can tell you, when you breathe out your last breath, that will be the last time God corrects you here on this earth. Until then, I mean, we look at Job. We can look at Job. God said about Job, have you considered my perfect servant, Job? He told Satan that. Have you considered my perfect servant, Job? But after Job's trial, for which I wonder how many could get through that one. And you know, when I was reading that book, I was like, Lord, I want, I want this. I want this. I want, I, I want you to say that about me. I want you to say, have you considered my perfect servant, Geneva? Lord, I want that. Whatever it takes for me to get there. And I did say, Lord, you know what I can bear. Take it easy on me. <laughs> Maybe not the whole thing at a time. I mean, and he knows that. But I mean, with all of my heart, again and again, as I was reading that book, and, and I couldn't, I don't know, you know, I just couldn't read through that book. I had to study that book. I had to go back and reread the chapters. I had to go over it and over again. And I'm like, you know, I don't care if I get behind. I had to listen to it, and I had to go back and reread it, and it just wasn't enough because I was just like, oh, Father, Father. I want you to say that about me. And you know what's amazing? What blows me away, what absolutely blows me away is not by works of righteousness that you have done, but according to my mercy, according to his mercy, according to his mercy, he saved us. None of us deserve, none of us could ever, ever, ever deserve this redemption this salvation, this glorious fellowship and relationship, but his goodness and his mercy calls us in, calls us in, has called us to join right in, to be partners, co-laborers with Jesus Christ the righteous. And he enables us by his Holy Spirit to fulfill all the work that he started in us, all of it. He enabled us, he enables us by the Holy Spirit to walk it all out, to live what he has done in our life. He comes and he completely destroys the work of the enemy out of our life. He didn't just come and destroy the work of the devil, you know, because we, we tend to see out there, you know, like, Jesus came to destroy the work of the devil. Yes, in our life. So Satan has no power over us. He has no place in our life to rule and reign anymore when we make Jesus our Lord and our Savior. He has no place. We have all power and authority over him. Once Jesus takes rule, we have the power and authority. So there is no reason, no excuse for us to allow the enemy to walk on us and defeat us and try to subdue us in any area of our life because we have the power and the authority to conquer Satan. And I wouldn't try to do that by myself. But I can call upon the name of the Lord. I can call 
upon that precious blood that he shed for me. Every moment. I mean, Jesus was tempted in all ways as we are. In all ways. So, you know, it's not that there won't be temptations. It's not that there won't be bombardments of thoughts. But it's when they come. The blood of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, for the blood that cleansed me, that washed me, that purified me, that set me in right standing with you. I thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit that you baptized me in to enable me to walk out and to live free from the powers of darkness. I thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And then we just jump right over into Psalms chapter 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. That's very simple. Don't get your counsel from ungodly people. Don't ask ungodly people what they think. Don't let ungodly people tell your children what to do. Don't let ungodly tell you what to do by being enticed through the media that they put out, that they try to basically brainwash people with. I mean, it's just, you know, it's the way it is. It's, it's propaganda. We think, oh, the North Koreans are under so much propaganda, and if you study and read out what, what, you know, read about what goes on over there and the propaganda that goes on over there, we got it over here. <laughs> if you don't think we're a bunch of cows running through the chute, getting the brand put on us, if we give ourselves to that, but we don't, we, we're, not supposed to, we're not supposed to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Nor are we supposed to stand in the way of sinners. No. Nor are we to sit in the seat of the scornful. No. And that is very simply laying that out so we can get it. It's very simple, simply having something to say about someone else and judging the way that they dealt with something. Always having a better idea than them. Just get up and do it. Just get up and do better. God's not, God's not waiting. I mean, we're not waiting on God. He's waiting on us to do better. If we think we can do better than somebody else in the situation that we're doing, we shouldn't be sitting in the seat and scornful talking about what they're doing, but we should get up and do better through the power of God that's in us. But our delight... Our delight is in the law of the Lord, and in it will we meditate day and night. So where are our meditations? So where are our thoughts? Where do we let our thoughts go? Do we daydream? I'm going to tell you this. Yeah, I had a person tell me one time, they're like, I just dreamt about such and such and such and such, and they're telling me this whole long thing. I'm like, you just dreamt? I'm like, what do you mean by you just dreamt? They were like, well, I was just dreaming. I mean, like last night? <laughs> and they're like, no, just a few minutes ago. And I was like, oh, that's, that's intense. <laughs> our, our thoughts are to be girded up. And, you know, to, where, where are your thoughts going? How many people are just dreaming? Walking through life just dreaming. I just dreamt, well, you know, you're awake. Actually, you know, when the Bible talks about dreams, it's in the night season when you're kind of out and the Lord comes and visits you in your dreams and he brings instruction there. And there's revelation and there's visions and there's all kinds of revelation during the, the night when you are asleep. But how, really, where are our thoughts? Are we just dreaming? Where are our thoughts on him? Are we meditating upon him day and night? Or what are we thinking about? And realizing that, our, that we're to pray continually without ceasing. We're to pray without ceasing. And so, you know, what are our thoughts? What are our meditations? Are they a prayer always? Could you say that you just dreamt heavenly things if that's what you do? It was all about, you know, what the Word of God says? And lining it up with the Word of God? Are your thoughts lined up in a place of prayer? What if that all the thoughts that you have are a prayer? And when you're having thoughts, you are praying. And I believe that to be true. 
I believe our thoughts are a prayer. So the thoughts that we are having, we are in communication with someone. Are we in communication with the Father in our thoughts? In his word, in his law, do we meditate day and night? That's fellowship, that's relationship. Our thoughts are fellowship, relationship, they're communion, right? Right? Isn't that communion? We're communing with someone about something. And does that communion that we're having line up with the word of God? Is it faith that's propelling us to the next place in God? Or are we having too much of our own time, we think, communing with our own selves, we think, and getting ourselves in the realm of where we're now going, oh, how did I get here? I failed. In thy law do I meditate day and night, and I will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I mean, we just have to look at it, finish it up. I'll just start with verse 3. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Whatever he does prospers. Whatever you do is blessed. If our thoughts line up with meditating upon the word of God day and night, if we learn to follow the Holy Spirit continually in our thoughts and lining them up with what the Holy Spirit is saying, whatever we do will prosper. Whatever, the blessing of God will be on it. You know, the blessing of God was on Job, right in the middle of the trouble. And I love what Job said to his wife when his wife says, okay, you know, that's it, buddy. Why don't you curse God and die? You've lost everything, and now you sit here with boils from the top of your head to the sole of your feet. And boils are a horrible thing. And you don't want one. And he had them all over his body. And his wife said, just curse God and die. Let it all be over with. Because, I mean, if he cursed God, the blessing would go from him. And that's what Satan wanted. Oh, Satan wanted to take down that man that God had so hedged in that Satan couldn't even get near anything he had because he was so determined to keep every precept of God through that fellowship and that relationship that he had with God. That fear of who he is. You know, when we do things that don't line up with the word of God, those things in our life that we open ourselves up to and we allow and we, you know, and, and maybe it's, it's an area where we haven't realized and God's revealed it to us. You know, a lot of people want to say, um, this is my demeanor, this is my personality, this is the way, you know, I am, this is the person I am. Well, we're to be like Jesus. We're, to, we're now to have the divine nature, have his DNA, not our own. Those things were to, uh, were to go to the cross and die. Those things were to be laid down. We're not supposed to have our own grumpy, you know, grandpa was grumpy, great-grandpa was grumpy, <laughs> you know, we're this nationality and this is the way we are. No, we're to be like Jesus. And so we're to yield those areas of our life to the Lord. But, you know, of course, people want to excuse it, but then Father's coming and he's working on it. He's dealing with it in our, in our lives and teaching us to surrender those things to him and not to continue on because this is just our demeanor. Well, is your demeanor like Jesus? Are you modeling Jesus? That's what we want to look at and take a hold of. 
Are we like him? Are we living out every moment? Our thoughts. The Lord's been talking to me really strong about our thoughts and about the imagination of men's heart. You know, we can go over and over the scriptures about the imagination of men's heart. We're wicked continually. That's where man will get you. So you want to take on the inheritance of your family? The imaginations of your heart will be wicked continually. Or do you want to take on... You know, and it's a spiritual sense. We pass on to our children a spiritual demeanor in all of our conduct. In every bit of our conduct, we're passing on a spiritual demeanor one way or the other. And, and more, more than anything, our personalities are spiritual. You know, they're just... Because we're, we're spirit people. And so we're passing on to our children... the things that we allow in our spirit. And so, dad was like that, grandpa was like that, or mom was like that, or grandma was like that, and so, you know, it's just inherited spiritually. Not your makeup. It's spiritual inheritance. Now, will we have the spiritual inheritance of man, or will we have the spiritual inheritance of the father? Have we been given the divine nature? Or are we still living over here in the natural realm of man? We living in the supernatural realm that he's brought us into in heavenly places, seated with him in heavenly places? Or are we over here in the natural realm of man? Where are we at? We want to we look at that. We want to know what our imaginations are. We want to know what our thoughts are. We want to lay it all out. We want to be real. As Father talks to us, we want to open ourselves up. See, that's rending your heart and not your garment. It's saying, Father, I want to be wide open so you can, you can get in here and you can work on anything. You know, I talk about my mom a lot. Um, and one day I was having a conversation with her. And I was asking her about where a member of the family got their personality, because I'm just like, you know, I don't see that in any of the family, and, and why is this person like this? And mom goes, that was me. And I'm like, you were kidding, because this person was a little bit high-strung, animated, into everything, always causing a ruckus, and, you know, there was always something going on. And if you knew my mom, that was not my mom. You know, I grew up with a mom that was constantly saying to my dad, yes, dear. Yes, dear. He's like, Sue, where's my socks? Sue, where's my wallet? Sue, honey, where's this? Where's that? And I'm just like, I remember as a kid going, you put it wherever it's at. <laughs> you know, why are you asking mom? I remember thinking about that, just going, why is he asking mom when he put his wallet down? She didn't do it. But anyway, she was just yes, dear, serving him. Thank the Lord my husband knows how to find his own wallet. I, you know, that is just one of my favorite blessings. You know, because I heard my dad ask my mom for his wallet my whole life. And I'm just so thankful. That my, I'm just like, Lord, I just thank you that you gave me a husband to find his own wallet. And notice that I put the socks in the same drawer that they are always in. And he's real good about getting them. I mean, I just like those things. But anyway, going on. And so my mom said that, that that was her. And she said in her late teens, she'd been serving the Lord for several years, but the Lord dealt with her one day and said, you cannot have that demeanor and walk with me and be an example for the kingdom of God. You've got to deal with this. And in one of those great church services where my mom grew up in, in her teen years and early 20s, she walked down the aisle and she took her high-strung temper that was just always trying to get somebody aggravated and, you know, cause... I mean, I didn't... I could not believe my mom was like that. Because, like, I mean, there's a lot of people here that know my mom. And, and Grace would never think that my mom was like that, would you? Because my mom was just the sweetest, most amazing, calm, quiet person. And... um she said, that day I walked down to the altar, and she goes, I laid that person down there. 
And I said, I will never be that person again. I will never act like that again. Lord, I give it to you. Now you change me. And how many have gotten on your knees? I've gotten on my knees. And I'm like, okay, Father, this is a situation that I find myself in again and again. And I'm like, Lord, I can't do it. But only you can. But I thank you, Father, that I have this hope. That if I give it to you, you will bring the change. You will bring the change here. And so from this day forward, we can change this earthly inheritance that we've received from our parents. And we can say, you know, these things were not a good thing to inherit. I don't want this inheritance. I want to take the inheritance of the Father so I can be like Jesus. And I just, you know, and we just bind and we just break off that spiritual inheritance because it's not a physical inheritance. The physical inheritance are the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the hair, how tall, how short. Those are physical inheritance. The, our conduct, are, that's spiritual. God's called us over into his realm, his glorious realm. Hallelujah. 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 And the way we stay there is we stay yielded. We're meditating on the things of the kingdom continually. And I mean, we'd all like to be still and meditate all day long on just the kingdom and just be in the word. But unfortunately in this life, we do have to get up and work. You know, I've had a real busy day today. I've gone nonstop. I got to sit down. Well, I got partly ready for church. And that's it. And then on the way to church, and that was really nice. But it's been a busy, it's just been busy. But we don't have to leave off going, Father, I want to be just like you. Just pressing in to that place, no matter what we're having to do. Of Lord, Lord, I want to respond like you. And just taking that moment. And just being aware, you know, he could come at any moment. And, you know, I belong to him, but am I, are we walking this out? But at the same time, not looking to ourselves, but looking unto Jesus. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12 real quick. Father, we just thank you that on this Christmas Eve, <laughs> we get to come and, and just be in your presence together. We thank you, Jesus for people that are so hungry for you, Father God, that they, they come on Christmas Eve to fellowship when there's so many things going on. You know, we could all be doing something. Christmas Eve, is, you know, it's a busy time. There's things to, to be done. I've got a stack. <laughs> but it's good to be in the house of the Lord. And you know what? Well, let's just start with verse 1. Wherefore seeing also, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so, with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us, I'm sorry, let us lay aside, I can't even see where I'm at for some reason. Yeah, the, the whole, the lights are out. I'm just going to start over. Wherefore, seeing, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight, every weight, let us lay aside every weight. So we're making sure the weights, the things that would hold on to us, every sin, the things that would try to grasp, grab a hold of us, we're making sure that they're laid aside. And let us, these things that would so easily beset us, so, so easily pull us down, get us back into the grip of the enemy. See, when Jesus, you know, and that's the point I really want to make, when Jesus washes us and cleanses us, he cleans us up of everything. He, he gives us his divine nature. He changes all of that spiritual inheritance that we inherit from our parents. But what happens is, People don't take a hold of the Word of God. They don't understand the Word of God. They don't have the knowledge of the Word of God. And they go back and they pick those things up. 
and not realizing because they were habits that were formed in their life for, for their whole life. And they come to Jesus, and Jesus does the work, but then they allow these things to, to slip in. And so then we think it's just the normal Christian life to live like this. And, and, and sadly to say, there's not a whole lot of example in the world of how to come out from among them and be separate. How to cut that thing off and to live with it cut off. You know, we have a huge responsibility as people come into this church and they give their lives to Jesus. They're looking at every one of us. They're looking at us to see the conduct that they're supposed to have. Of course, they're looking to Jesus and the Holy Spirit's drawing them, but we have the big impact upon them because we are the spiritual leaders. We are leaders. If you've been saved before them, you're a leader. And so they're looking to us. And so that's what's happened in the church. Throughout the world today, we've got a lot of people that have looked to leaders that haven't found that place in God to really follow God and to be good leaders. And so people fall back into a lot of things that, that shouldn't be there. But thank God for his mercy. He draws us over into that yeah. place of perfection continually. And he's continually perfecting things in us, but we have, to, we have to press in. We have to continually every day lay aside those things that would pull on us and focus, keep our focus on what God's called us to do and be obedient to his word and follow the Holy Spirit. Looking unto Jesus. I didn't finish there. And the sin which so easily besets us and let us run. So it's a lot of running to do. It's a race. We're in a race. We're running. With patience, the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, not looking unto us. We look to Jesus. He did it. He did this. He laid this out for us to follow in his footsteps. So we need to keep our eyes on how he did it. We need to continually meditate on what Jesus did. He was tempted in all ways as we are yet without sin. So that is what he wants us to look to. He doesn't want us to look, at to, to, look to self and he doesn't want us to look to man. He wants us to look to leadership that God's called, that are passionate, that, people that, that are godly. He doesn't want us to look to people that are ungodly, even if they're in leadership. And, you know, we were talking at my house, and I got my kids staying with me right now, and we were talking at my house the other night about how thankful we are to be in a church like this because we've been to many other churches. And we, you know, I've been raised up, seen a lot of ministry, and how thankful we are, even though Pastor Mark's my brother, you know, forget about the brother thing. Forget about the uncle, uncle thing. But look at that passion in a man of God that just his heart is to go whole after, completely after God. I mean, if he knows he's doing anything that doesn't make Father happy, man, he is like, eh, getting it out of the way. I mean, as soon as he's just bulldog, bulldozing through the whole mess, and he's like not willing to leave anybody behind. He wants to take everybody with them into this place. And I mean, we are so blessed to sit in a church where there's a man that wants to walk holy and righteous before God. Because there's few. There's very few. I've been in the back room with the, with the group after service. And, you know, I've heard all the stuff that is said. And you go, what happened from the platform to back here? But you can go in the back room with, with Pastor Mark. And I mean, the man walks with God. And his heart is to not allow the enemy to have any place in his life. I mean, it's a treasure. It's such a treasure. And most people don't want that. You know why? Because they want to hold on to their sin and their iniquity. And, and everybody else in the church world does. And why can't they have it? Because they still have a pleasure in sin. That means they really haven't given their life over to Jesus. They haven't said, here I am, Lord, take all of me. They will say the words, but they haven't in their heart. 
They haven't said, Lord, I am going to walk this out with you. I'm going to be obedient to you. If I have to repent 490 times in a day, I'm going to do it because, Lord God, I want to walk with you. And I thank God for that kind of mercy. He's that merciful. And that's how much we can't look to ourselves. Yeah, Jesus did it. And he, you know, he was tempted in all ways, yet without sin. And this is, this is where we're going. But he made such a place of mercy that if we have a heart to go, oh, God, I don't want to, I, Lord, how did I get over here again? Father, forgive me. And a heart that's turning and saying, Lord, God, I want to walk with you. Jesus, have mercy on me. I hate everything of the enemy. His mercy is right there. His goodness is right there. His loving kindness is right there. And, you know, we don't have to be like Martin Luther was, crawling up the stairs on glass and, and beating themselves. You know, he beat himself in the back, trying to make himself obtain to God. You know, they took, you know, those, those monks and those priests, they would take things and beat themselves, and then they would, you know, do all these penance trying to get good enough to come to God, trying to do something to the body that the body would connect with not doing whatever. But we're to look unto Jesus. Mm -hmm. He is the beginning of our salvation. He's the perfecter of our salvation. He's the beginning and the end. He is able to keep those things that you have committed unto him. If you will keep them committed, he will keep, them, he will keep that covenant with you. As long as you're going after it. And you're running the race. I'm not talking about people sitting on the sidelines saying, go on, keep going, don't give out. I'm going to sit here and take a break. I'm talking about people that are in the race. God keeps covenant with you as long as you're running. He's so good. He's so merciful. But let us go on. Let us, let us just go on to perfection. Let us not like be like babes for the rest of our life, you know, just having to have milk. But let us, let, let's, let's go on past the, the, the principles of, of doctrine, faith towards God, repentance of dead works. Let's go on past those places. Let's get a hold of the fact that, you know, we repent of sin, now we live free from sin. And, and let us go on and take a hold of the meat in the race. Let us go on and be those people that walk and live out revival in the glory of God. Every one of us having revelations and visions and impartations that, that, that God gives us to, to just do the work of the ministry, miracles, signs, wonders, all the things that God's called us to do. Let us, let us just stop building the foundation Let's go past the foundation. We've got the foundation right here. Faith towards God, repentance of dead works. Now, let's build on it. There's so much to build. You know, you look as we're reading in uh, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all those, you know, times, Joshua, Judges. You get into Judges and you still find that those people, that different, different tribes never went in and fully possessed the land that God gave them. God gave them the land. The inhabitants were still there. When God gave the Israelites, the, the, the tribes of Israel, the land, he said, now you go up and you possess it. That meant take the sword in hand and go up. When God said go up, and drive out the inhabitants. And God had rules to doing that. And we find, you, you look at it, and they kept part of it, and they didn't do all of it. And, and God said, look, I'll drive them out. I'll send hornets and drive them out. You just do your part by being faithful and go up and possess it. You go up and possess the land. I'll do the work. And they went up, and they would partly possess. They would partly do what God told them to do. Some of them did what God told them to do, but most of them weren't obedient all the way. And there were some that didn't even, 
didn't even go in and possess the whole land. Most of them didn't, didn't take the full inheritance that they could have had, ever, ever. How about us? God says, we have it. We have all of heaven at our disposal. Every, every one of the gifts are obtainable to us. And are we laying hold? Are we going up and possessing the land that God's given us? Or are we caught up and busy and waiting for another day? I tell you what, another day is running out for a lot of us. Mm-hmm. It's like going by rather quickly. Are we, take, are we laying a hold of these precious promises? Are we driving out all the inhabitants of the land that would try to hold us back from our promises? Because God's already given them to us, but the enemy says, no, you can't have them. Or, and, and we don't even see it that clearly. What we see is, you know, our failure a lot of times. We get stuck in our failure. We get, stu- we get stuck in, okay, God, how am I going to attain to this? Oh, it's just a gift. You know, you know, we don't handle the Word of God correctly, and we just go, it's a gift, and if I don't have it, I don't have it. No, be passionate about it and you'll get it. You'll receive whatever you, you're passionate about, you can lay hold of. I didn't start having dreams and visions and God showing me things that's even happening in other people's ministry and calling Pastor Mark up and said, saying, look, you know, the Lord showed me that so-and-so has is, is got this going on in their life and... and uh, I hadn't even thought of this, this minister in a long, long time, and the Lord just showed me all of his back closet and everything that's going on in his life and what he's been doing, and he's getting ready to go to so-and-so's church. And Pastor Mark gets on it, calls him up, and, and said, yeah, all that stuff is going on in his life, but we wanted to bless him and just help him and try to encourage him. Pastor Mark goes, don't you have that? Don't you have that garbage in your church? Don't put it before your people because it's going to run through your church like wildfire. You know, but I ask for it. I want that. I want to lay hold of these things. Well, I really didn't want to preach, but it got to feeling like fire shut up in my bones when I'm like, Lord, I want more of you, 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 I want more of you. But I didn't want to get up in front of people. But then it was exploding on the inside of me. And now I'm going, oh God, all I want is your kingdom. Father God, I want to count this so precious every moment that you allow me to have part in this. And I want to count it even more precious. I don't count it precious enough. We don't, we don't realize. We're, we're blinded in part. We don't realize. We let, you know, just like they did, you know, well, why, why kill off all the sheep and the goats and the cows? You know, what, what sense does that make? You know, I tell you what sense it makes. Be obedient to God. God knows more than you know. Why kill off all, all, all the babies? Because they grow up and they become your enemy. And they're little, they're little demons now. But if you allow those little demons to grow up in your life, they'll get to be big demons and they'll take you out. They'll kill you. And it's really a typification of a people that were sold out to Satan, sold under bondage, would not hear the gospel, given over to evil and wickedness. I mean, look at, look at the effect that it had in Israel because they allowed it to be around them. Look at the effect that it had on Solomon. The wisest man in all the earth. And he didn't listen to God. He didn't obey completely. Obedience is extremely important. And we want to look in the law of liberty and we want to say, Father, teach me your ways and I'll keep them. Teach me your ways, Father. Teach me your judgments. Father, you are my delight. Your word is my delight. Lord, and I will walk in it. And I'll lay hold of these precious gifts, these precious promises. Father, I want to be one of those in the earth today that lives it out, that walks it out. Lord, I want, I, I want to be all that you've called me to be. 
I don't want to look at my ability because my ability would not be standing here. Because my ability cannot speak in front of people. I do not like that. I never did. But his ability, his ability, and I lean totally and completely upon him because I do not have this ability. And so that is in everything. We take a hold of God, <laughs> and through his ability and his power, we speak forth that word of power by the Holy Ghost. And it is formed and happens just like the world was created, just like Jesus spoke forth and let there be waters, and the Spirit brewed upon the waters. He said, let there be light and divide the waters from the land. You know, it, whatever Jesus spoke, the Holy Spirit began to do. And then he put that same power on the inside of us to speak his word. We do not realize the power that we have in our word because he is in us. He wants us to take a hold of what he's done. He wants us to come in to our inheritance and inherit this. And how many of us can sit here tonight and say that we have come into our full inheritance and we've driven out all the inhabitants of the land and we've not left one and we've been holy and completely obedient to God. And we've not let one thing hold on to us and keep us back from inheriting everything that God said. It's already yours. I've given it to you. Now possess it. Oh, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. <laughs> Lord, we want to take a hold of this inheritance. We want to possess all that you've given us. Lord, we want to be so full of the Holy Ghost that you can't even see us anymore. That all you see is the Holy Spirit. All you see is Jesus. All you see is the Father. All you hear, Father, when we speak, Father, we're not speaking our own words. We're not doing our own thing, oh God. But all of our words are the words that you are speaking through us. All of them. And you think of Samuel. And God didn't let one of his words fall to the ground. And it wasn't because Samuel was going around just rat-a-tat-tat-tat-tat with his mouth. But he was in that relationship and that fellowship with God that he found when he was a very young boy, younger than Jacob and Josiah here, a very young boy when God said, Samuel, Samuel. And he ran to Eli and said, yes, Eli, you called me. And Eli said, no, I didn't call you. And then he says, go lay back down. And the Lord said, Sam. And he ran back to Eli and Eli says, no, I didn't call you. And then he's fin Eli finally tells him, say, say to him, it's, it's the Lord, Samuel. So say to him, here I am. And Samuel lived out that relationship of here I am. And God downloaded a young boy whose heart was willing to hear. He downloaded him. A young boy that was dedicated to the Lord. He downloaded him with the word of everything that was going to happen to Eli and Eli's sons and all of Israel. And when Samuel... As he grew as a man of God in, statures, in stature of the Holy Spirit, people feared for Samuel to show up. They were like, is he coming for peace or is there trouble? Because they knew if Samuel spoke that it would happen because not one of his words fell to the ground. And will we be that Samuel? Will we be that man and woman of God? That would just say, God, I'm going for this. You know, I'm getting up there in, my, in years, but I'm not going to give up. I'm just saying, oh God, how long will I be a child? Lord, I want to take a hold and live out everything. I want to possess fully. I want to fully possess the land and drive out all the inhabitants. And take hold of everything and speak forth your word and your word alone. 
Oh, praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Because we've been given all of this. We've been given all of this. It's ours. Turn with me real quick. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for a people hungry for revival, hungry for the move of God, a people that come out on Christmas Eve when there's so many things that they could do because they're hungry for you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father God. We thank you, Father God, that you stir revival. Father, in this place, Lord Jesus said, now one of us will hold on, but we will go in and possess the land. We won't hold on to our own life. We won't count our own life dear to us any longer. Lord Jesus, we're sick of counting our life dear to ourselves, God. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't partway get finished with Hebrews, but I want to run over here to Second Peter, chapter one. According, verse three, according as His divine power has given unto us all things, all things, His divine power has given unto us all things. All. We look at the children of Israel, we see where God spoke and said. The land is yours, they give it to you, and we get frustrated with them because they didn't go up and do what they were supposed to do. And here we are. Here we are. We're to be possessors of all things, given unto us all things. His divine power has given us to all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. God's nature. Not dad and mom's nature or grandma and grandpa's nature. God's nature. We're living in realms of heaven, not in realms of the earth. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We've clean escaped it through the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And if we'll just remind ourselves continually what the word of God says when the enemy comes out against us, he cannot take us out because we stand under the blood of Jesus Christ. We stand in that blood that washes us and cleanses us and keeps us. That eternal blood that paid the debt for us that we do not have to be brought back down under the grips of Satan. We do not have to be brought back into his power. We have power over him through the blood of Jesus Christ. We don't ever have to be his slave again. If we just call out, we look to Jesus and we call out to him who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And now he sat down with the Father in heavenly places. He endured. Will we endure? Will we press in? Will we run this race and endure? Will we, will we allow the Holy Spirit to give us all the endurance to run the race? Or do we have to jump track? Ever so often and take break. The break side of it's not pretty because that's the downside of it. He gives us the endurance to run this race. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And besides this, wait, wait, no, back up. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I did read that. And besides this, giving all diligence. So you know what? We're just soldiers. But we look to Jesus. It's not our ability, it's his. Looking unto Jesus. Giving all diligence. All diligence. Add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. And to, to knowledge, temperance. Giving all diligence, you add. 
you allow the Holy Spirit to add these things, you see, okay, I don't have the temperance that I need. Lord, I don't have the knowledge that I need. So, by your Holy Spirit, I'm taking a hold of this. You, Lord, you've given it to me. It's mine. It's mine. Right here, Lord. Right here, Lord, you said it's mine. Now I've got to get this through. It's mine, Lord. Now I'm going to possess it. And I'm going to run out anything that's going to keep me from, from possessing all that you said that I can have. And I'm going to give diligence and I'm going to add to this faith that you've given me. I'm going to add virtue. And to the virtue, I'm going to add knowledge. And to the knowledge, I'm going to add temperance. Just like my mother. The story I told you. The temperance. Another story that I just heard about this man <clears throat> that I've heard recently that he may run for president of the United States. But he, um, he had a real short temper as a young man and as a, as a teenager. And he was always getting in, into fights and always had something going. He had a real short fuse. And he got in a fight with a friend one day, pulled a knife, stabbed his friend. Now, where does that lead you? That temper. That temper that you never would yield to God. Where does that lead? You kill somebody, your life is over. His life, that person's life's over. Your life is over because you're going to go to prison or you're going to die. And, you know, you're going to get the death, death penalty because you went and stabbed somebody over just a, a short fuse because you got mad. Because he took your marble. You know, you didn't, you know, he didn't win it fair and he took the marble and you get I mean, that's how stupid a little fight gets over and then somebody, somebody is hurt and he, he takes that knife and he stabs his friend right in the stomach. And then he's shocked and he pulls back the knife in his hand. He's in total shock that he just stabbed somebody with his temper. But the knife hit the guy's big belt buckle and broke the knife and, his li and, he, and he was spared two people spared because of the mercy of God and that young man he went home he grabbed his grandmother's Bible and he got down on his knees and he cried out to God for God to change him and save him he began to read the word of God and ask God to change him and he said that day he laid down that temper before God he laid his life down he became a, a renowned surgeon known around the world and now looking to run for president and never had another bout with his temper ever again because one day he laid it down before God. He knew that he needed Jesus. He just about wrecked his life and the life of, and killed someone else, destroyed someone else's life. We don't want, we don't want to wait around and let those things, let something like that happen in our life. We want to give ourselves to following Jesus. Give all diligence. We can't just go half cocked, you know, zippity doo dah, about with our life and think, you know, someday it's all going to come out all right. There's this guy that I witnessed to in, in Trader Joe's, and I'm continually, you know, just ministering to him. You only, you only get so long of a time in checkout, you know. And, you know, I, one day I even came back and I gave him the Gospel of John a little booklet that I usually carry around with me. And I came back and got in line. He, here, here he is checking out somebody else. I'm like, look, I want you to read this book. I want just, just read this. And so I go through and I ask him if he's read it. And he goes, yeah, I read it now and then, you know, and it's always got such good stuff to say and it makes me feel good. And, you know, it's, you know, it's just, it's got good karma. I'm like, it doesn't have any karma to it. <laughs> I said, that's spirit and that's life, that's God. And, you know, he's in this stuff. And so, you know, the other day I'm, I'm walking through, I'm there and I, I get in his line. And I'm like, have you read that, that book I gave you? Have you read all of John? He goes, no, but he goes, you know, I do, I do. I still pick it up and I think about you all the time that you, you know, were so nice to give me this. And, and I said, you know, it's just way more than that. It's, do you know what it says? Do you believe that this is, that this is real? And he goes, well, you know, I'm a good person. And I figure, you know, the way I think is that if you're a good 
person and you do good to people and, you know, it's all going to work out in the end. And I said, well, you're going to have to come to grips with something. I go, everybody likes Jesus. Everybody's like, you know, Jesus was a good guy. He's cool. Um, but either Jesus, you're going to have to make a decision. Either Jesus was telling the truth and he was God because he said he was God or he's a liar. So which is he to you? Was he telling the truth? Is he the son of God or is he a liar? He goes, that's an intense way to look at it. <laughs> and I said, well, that's a real way to look at it. Because if he was telling the truth, you better know what he said and you better let God work in you. And he's like, I'm going to have to think about that some. <laughs> and he's like, I'm sorry that it's, you know, such a quick conversation all the time. You know, I've given him cards to the church and stuff like that. He goes, because you, you really make me think. You know, I like talking to you. <laughs> you know, and I'm just claiming a soul for the kingdom of heaven because, you know, one day God just pointed them out to me. You know, and there's just different people that you just, you know, you keep sowing that seed. You keep sowing the seed. And you keep pulling on them through prayer, you know, breaking off the mind-blinding spirits that blind them from hearing the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But, you know, so, but it's like that. It's like that. People just are going on with their own way, doing it, doing it however they think. It's like that in the church, sadly to say, because people don't know the word of God, because people don't fear God in the church. We must continually, continually exhort one another daily while it is yet day. Lest there be in any of us an evil heart of unbelief. What is an evil heart of unbelief? Not believing what the Word of God says and living it. There's no fear of God if we don't live what He says. So if you're not living what He says, then you need to ask Him, Father God, <laughs> awaken me to the truth. Lord, put your fear so in my heart. Put your dread so in my heart. Oh, God, that I will not just carelessly walk out my life like that guy at Trader Joe's. That, you know, I just figure. I just figure. I'm like, everybody wants to come to Jesus their own way, but it won't work that way. Everybody's got their idea that they can just, you know, like Jesus, but they're going to come to him their own way. It's not going to happen. And so all I can do is sow that word and pray that it pierces his heart and that a seed grows. And he's telling me, you know, I'm so busy, I can't read all, you know, all of that little book of 1 John, of John. Because I, you know, just had a newborn and I've got five kids. And I'm like, you know, I could give him the list of what all I do. But, um, you know, I know we're busy. But are we too busy for God? We don't want him to too, be too busy for us. One day when we stand before him, we don't want him to be too busy because we were too busy. Jesus, Lord Jesus. And to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brother, brother, brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound... They make you that you shall be ne neither that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind. Mm. So the list. Are we given all diligence that every one of these things are manifested in our life? Mm -hmm. If we're not, if we lack these things, then what are we? Blind. 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 If we're lacking these things, what are we? I think we need to memorize the list, right? And then give all diligence to know that we're not lacking. To know without a doubt that we're not lacking. And, and all, you know, the amazing thing is all we have to do is simply yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit and then we're not lacking. True. It's just a simple yielding because we have already inherited this. We've already been given this divine nature, but we don't possess it. Just like the children of Israel. And I feel like the Lord just keeps 
wanting me to drive that point even in my own life because I don't like what they did. It irritates me that they didn't obey God. I got very frustrated reading that. I'm like, goodness gracious, why did I just listen? And the Lord's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> why? And then you go, ouch. Blind. And cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Has forgotten. Are we so busy we've forgotten in anything? Because it's all diligence. We can't come to Jesus the way we want to either. Not just the guy in Trader Joe's, but we can't come to Jesus the way we want to. We've got to come the way that he says and the way he says and that only and there's no other way but the way he says. And the church is asleep in this area. It's asleep in this area. We think we're coming to God the way we are and we're not. We're coming the way he says. And if we're not possessing the land, then we're blind and we've forgotten. Wherefore, rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. You will never fall. You will never fall. And Father will say, have you considered my perfect servant? What's your name? Because you're going to possess it, right? Amen. You're going to give all diligence to it, right? You're going to take a hold of this, right? Yes. Amen. Not by your ability, but looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, not looking at yourself, not going inward and getting all full of head condemnation, blah, 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 stuff that does nothing but suck the stinking life out of you yeah. and keep you all worked up in your head so you can't yield yourself to the Holy Spirit because you're all wor worked up in you. It ain't about you. It's about Him. Looking to him. Him is looking up, not in. Because you can't do it. But he can. All you've got to do is yield to what he says and say, God, I'm getting this. I'm getting, I'm going after it by the Holy Spirit. And we read over and over and over in the Old Testament about come before his presence with rejoicing and joy, mm -hmm. not with sorrow and sadness. If we're living in his sight, we come and we hear these things and we take a hold of them and we possess them with joy. We, we partake in the feast of his word with rejoicing and joy and gladness in our heart that we're going to take a hold of it and we're going to live it out by the Holy Spirit and I'm yielding myself to you, Father. I yield myself to you right now, Father. Thanks. I'm going to take a hold and possess all that you have called me to possess. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Just, a, just a clear road map. A clear road map <laughs> of us living it out. And we've got to take a hold of it and possess every bit of it every moment of every day so we can stop staying at the foundation but go ahead and begin to build the kingdom and the house of God in the earth today. Hallelujah. Everybody yes. just stand with me. We praise you, Father. We praise you, Father God, for what you are doing in this place, Father. We praise you, Father God, that you are calling people up into the realms of glory and up yes. into the realms of your presence, Father, to walk with you, to know you, to behold you. And Jesus, we just thank you, Father God, that your word goes deep down in every one of our hearts, Lord Jesus, that we take a hold of your word, Father, and by the Holy Spirit, we walk it out. Father, we give ourselves diligently to your word to take a hold of it and say, Father, I am living it out. Father, you show me your statutes and your judgments and your, and your laws, and I will keep them, and I will do that. Do it by your Holy Spirit, and I will look to you and not to myself and not to my own ability. I thank you, Lord Jesus. I praise you, Father, for the glory of heaven. I thank you, Father, for this, this impartation of the Holy Spirit that leads us and guides us into the truth. And Father God, cause us to be so sensitive to your Holy Spirit and so obedient 
Lord, obedient servants in everything, Father, possessing all that you have given us. Yes. In the mighty name of Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We praise you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, I want to say this. Is there, if there's anybody in this place that doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to come right now. Right now. Come to Him. Give your life to Him. Don't try to come to Jesus your own way any longer. Make up your mind right now. Jesus is here to meet you, to change your life, to set you on the path of righteousness. To set you in the way of walking out your life before Him that you will receive eternal life for all eternity. And so if, you, if there's anybody in this place that doesn't know Jesus, I want you to come and I want you to come quickly. Don't hold on. Don't hold on to your life. Jesus is dealing with you. And you want to come and you want to come quickly. You want to make it right. And I'm going to leave the altar open for anybody that wants to come to Jesus. As David sings a song, and we all just worship the Lord before we go.